All right, well, good and welcome to this Utilities Technology Council webinar about how Virginia's industrial utilities are solving digital technology. My name again is Rob Armeyer. I am the Senior Director of Communications here at the Utilities Technology Council, and I am just so thrilled to see so many people have joined us today. We have a fantastic panel discussion. We have a, a great keynote speaker who's going to kick us off this, this afternoon. Uh, before we do that, I do want to make a couple quick housekeeping remarks very quickly. Uh, we know we have about an hour and a half to this webinar, and we will certainly have lots of questions that we hope to get to. And uh, before we do that, let me just very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with UTC, we were established in 1948 to assist electric utilities in acquiring radio spectrum for the communications networks. Think back to the post-war era as the economy was, was booming and utilities were building out their systems. They needed a way to stay in touch with their crews out in the field, stringing the new lines and repairing lines after an outage. As we all know, as you'll hear a common theme in today's webinar is the lack of communications infrastructure out in rural areas. Electric utilities have a lot of infrastructure out in these locations and by and large have run their own communications networks to assist and keep their crews in contact with each other. And over time, as technologies have evolved, they've added a number of innovations and sensors and technologies that give far greater control in much more reliability to the system thanks to teleprotection, SCADA, and all kinds of systems. So we were established in the 40s to help utilities do that. Our membership has expanded to include all members, all utility types, so some gas and water pipelines. We also, what stands us out a little bit from the other invest from the other associations, that we represent investor and utilities, cooperative utilities, and public power utilities. So we represent all different kinds of ownership structures, sizes, and types of utilities. And that's because, for the most part, every utility has this, all the similar issues with networks. Uh, whether you're the biggest investor in utility or the smallest rural cooperative, you have you face a lot of the same challenges in developing your networks. So uh, again, we were we have our members as they pursue these telecom and IT networks. We are the voice of course state federal agencies. So think of the Federal Communications Commission for one. We have a lot of conferences, a lot of meetings, and we are the prime advocate before Congress and elsewhere on a lot of these issues. Uh, also, real quickly, since there's so many on the line today, we via yeah, the phone. We will, however, take questions through the, the question and the, the chat function. So at any time, please use the question mark, the question tab, and type your question in. Uh, Congressman Griffith will be speaking shortly, and we will take some questions. So please use the question function there. And then we're going to have our two panelists, or I'm sorry, our four panelists, and then take questions from everybody at the end. So without further ado, we're going to be tag teaming this today. I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Dave Rodden, who is our Director of Government Affairs and Communications, to introduce our keynote speaker. Dave? Thanks, Rob. Um, and, and thank you to all the panelists and attendees for taking the time to listen today. Um, and, and like Rob said, before I introduce the congressman, I want to let everyone know if there's time after the congressman's remarks, we will host a quick question and answer session before the utility presentation. Um, so if you are interested in submitting a question, uh, please submit those via the chat function, and we'll do our best to get your questions answered. Uh, please make sure you have selected the send question to staff option. Okay, great. Um, so. Now, as many of you know, Congressman Griffith was first elected to represent the 9th Congressional District of Virginia in November of 2010. Uh, the 9th District includes Grayson County, which will be home to the Appalachian Power Gigabean, Gigabean Broadband Project that we'll be learning a little bit more about today. Uh, Congressman Griffith sits on the very important and influential House Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over many important issues that our country is facing today. Uh, this obviously includes issues surrounding broadband deployment and connectivity and providing reliable and affordable broadband to um, unserved and underserved communities throughout our country. Uh, during his time in Congress, Congressman Griffith has worked to close the rural digital divide. Among many other efforts, he has advocated for the inclusion of broadband initiatives within any potential infrastructure bill and has advocated for USDA rural development loans and grants for projects in the district that have supported broadband efforts. 
Um, he's also a co-sponsor of the Data Act, which was recently signed into law and will improve the accuracy of the Federal Communication Commission's broadband availability maps by strengthening the process by which that data is collected. Uh, Congressman, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. The, the partnerships formed between Appalachian Power and Gigabeam and Dominion Energy and Prince George Electric, they're, they're very exciting and uh, I think bring a new level of interest to electric utility broadband deployment efforts. So we really very much appreciate your interest here and I will turn it over to you now for your remarks. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. And let me just say up front, I prefer questions, and so please get those into the chat room. Uh, hopefully, my comments won't be too long or too boring, but I always like to get the questions. That way, I know at least one person is actually paying attention and has not yet fallen asleep <laughs> from my comments. Uh, so I do appreciate it. You know, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about the Ninth District, and some do, so I apologize to those that do. But the Ninth District of Virginia has many communities uh, that continue to face barriers to economic growth and prosperity, and in large measure, a big part of this is because of the lack of broadband. Now, the Ninth District uh, 20, 25 years ago would have uh, had as its industries uh, tobacco, textiles, furniture, coal, and general agriculture. And those were our big five 25 years ago. As you, if you paid attention to that list, Tobacco is greatly reduced. Textiles is greatly reduced. Coal is greatly reduced. Furniture is greatly reduced. They all exist, but they're greatly reduced. So we're told by those who wanted those, some of those industries to go away, you got to reinvent yourself. You've got to come up with new ideas. Well, it's very hard if somebody wants to come up with a new idea and they live in an area that doesn't have broadband. And so this is a serious challenge, and it's shared by other rural areas across the country. But I like to think we're a little bit different. Maybe some of the western uh, districts are similar because the mountains make it even more so uh, more difficult than it would in just being rural. So we've got rurals and we rural district and a mountainous district. And the reason I bring that up is, is that Blacksburg, Virginia is one of the most highly wired communities in the country. But if you travel three to five miles outside of Blacksburg in certain parts of Montgomery County, you will find people who have no broadband, uh, farmers who complain that they can't keep up with their competitors because they need the newest software to work with, with their herd and with their crops and so forth, and they don't have the ability to do that online. These are the kinds of things we're facing. Now, you would expect that in Grayson County, and you might expect that in Dickinson County and some of the more rural districts, but you would think uh, Montgomery County, which is the most populous county in the Ninth District with the towns of Christiansburg and Blacksburg and, and Virginia Tech, they wouldn't have a problem, but they do too. Now, I'm not sure that what you're all doing will help in those areas because it's pockets here and pockets there. But in places like Grayson, what we're talking about today and what that experiment or pilot project in Grayson County is going to do for that county is absolutely amazing. And I'm very, very pleased to. Uh, know that that's going on and thank everybody for being involved in that. Now, as we move forward and more Americans work, learn, and, and do telehealth at home, we're seeing to a large extent the importance of fast and reliable broadband, which makes this webinar especially important at this time because uh, I'm pushing, uh, our committee has telecommunications, it also has healthcare. And we're trying to do more and more with telehealth so people in rural areas can get um, medical attention, can see doctors, even before we had coronavirus. But with coronavirus, it's imperative that a lot of these folks be able to get uh, at least follow-up attention, et cetera, without having to go into the doctor's office. So it's extremely important. And we're going to continue to work uh, to try to move forward on telehealth but it makes it very difficult if you don't have uh, uh, broadband in your community or at your home. So this is very important. Now we'll continue to debate the issues uh, to and try to do what we can to address the digital divide. And I'm glad we're discussing your role and the electric utilities role in that type of uh, program today. Um, you all can help that middle mile in bringing connectivity to underserved and unserved communities in Virginia and throughout the country. Now, the pilot program that I'm talking about was in part pioneered by legislation by my good friend, 
said that Israel O'Quinn, Israel's out of the Bristol area, um, and he lives in in the Washington County, Bristol area. I'm not sure which side of the line he's on. But he uh, put in legislation last year in the Virginia General Assembly to set up this pilot project to see what we could do with that middle mile. And so that bill created a pilot program to allow electric utilities to expand that middle mile broadband coverage, the infrastructure that connects the networks and core routers on the internet to local internet service providers that serve businesses and consumers directly. It helps to ensure that grid modernization and rural brand broadband expansion, expansion efforts are not conducted in silos. It allows electric utilities to add extra fiber cables to rural substations in addition to the fiber they're already laying. This makes a lot of sense, and I, I appreciate that and commend uh, Israel for having the vision to put that bill in and get it passed. I'm particularly excited about the project that we're going to talk about later in Grayson County. And as you've heard, Appalachian Power has partnered with Gigabeam Networks out of Bluefield, Virginia, also in the 9th Congressional District, to install up to 238 miles of fiber optic cable on its utilities poles in Grayson County. Now I'm going to let Brad Hall with Appalachian Power and Michael Clemens with Gigabeam speak more as to what they're doing in Grayson County. But I want you all to know how excited I am that a county as rural and spread out, and it's got some mountains, uh, as as Grayson County is, will have the opportunity to be connected as a result of this pilot program. And by the way, if you buy a live Christmas tree, there's a good chance you might be buying one from Grayson County if it's not local, because Grayson County produces, I think, more Christmas trees than any other county in Virginia. It's high enough up that you can get all the different species. But that gives you some idea of how difficult it would be for uh, somebody to come in there and lay the uh, fiber optics without having a uh, partnership with um, an electric utility as the middle mile uh, provider. So with that being said, I'm happy to open it up for questions and y'all can ask me anything. Sure, sure. Had myself on mute there, my bad. There you go. That's all right. Well, that thank, thank you, We're Congressman. All good I, I, in this day of that's right. Doing these uh, webinars and Zoom calls. Go ahead. I made that mistake more than once, unfortunately. Uh, you know, thank, thank you for your, your remarks, Congressman, um, especially within the context of telehealth. I know that's that's a very important issue, um, especially now uh, during the, the pandemic, but certainly moving forward, um, having those capabilities will be very important. Um, so. I, I guess first question for you is, you know, you know, we know it's difficult to know exactly what the remainder of the congressional year will bring. Um, and this is kind of two questions. Do you believe Congress will continue to work on broadband expansion, expansion opportunities uh, for unserved, underserved communities? And then kind of Similar to that, how can UTC and our members assist you in pursuing um, any potential opportunities moving forward in that space? Well, I definitely think we're going to move forward. I mean, a lot of the people who were uh, skeptical of telehealth uh, are now big proponents. Now that they've had to use it, uh, I've talked to any number. I mean, obviously, live is still better, but uh, all kinds of healthcare professionals are recognizing that not only can they do telehealth, but that they should be doing telehealth for a lot of their uh, patients. As a result of that, uh, I think there's never been more support for telehealth than there is right now. What that means, though, is, is then you turn around and the people who need telehealth are generally uh, outside of the city center, and that therefore, they're going to need to have broadband. And so the two are connected. And I do think that there will be, as we move forward and we see another package, now, you know, we've got the, you've got the partisan fights that will happen as well. But I think as we, as we work towards a package, I think you will see an additional package, which includes infrastructure as a main uh, part of that. And that will include additional money to uh, build out our broadband network and make sure that, you know, we're not leaving any part of the country behind. Obviously, there will be a focus on, uh, which there always has been with broadband, on the small businesses, the startups getting started, being able to 
put a business in rural areas that needs broadband and can't go there now. All that's important. But I think the final piece of the puzzle, which will make a big difference for uh, a lot of people voting on, on expending the money, is the fact that telehealth has been has been very successful where people have access to broadband. And it has really saved a lot of lives during this pandemic. Absolutely. Might, Thank you, Congressman. Yeah, and if I might, yep, if I go, might go add, right when I say save, when I say saved lives, I don't want anybody to misunderstand that. It hasn't saved somebody with coronavirus, but what we're finding is, is that people won't go to the hospital to get their regular treatment. People won't uh, check in with their uh, team of mental health professionals, and telehealth is reaching out uh, and and getting to people that we we would not have been able to get to other in other ways. So that when I say it's saving lives. It's saving lives because somebody gets a hold of, of is able to actually look at their health care provider on the screen and talks them through a down period. Or if they're having, you know, some kind of a problem, whether it be a diabetic problem or a heart problem with telehealth, they can at least say, yeah, you get you need to get yourself to the hospital right now. Otherwise, they're going to sit at home and go, yeah, I think I'll ride this out. And we've heard of those stories, too, unfortunately where people thought they could ride it out and they, they, were, they did not make it. But telehealth is really helping. And then quality of life issues we've heard of, you know, things is, that you wouldn't really think of. But, uh, you know, physical therapy where, yeah, you got to be taught how to do it probably live. But if you already know how to do it, your physical therapist can see you doing the exercise and say, hey, lift your leg. Can't do that if you don't have broadband. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm going to kick this next question over to Rob, who's looking at the uh, the chat. Rob, go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you again, Congressman. Uh, we did get a question about the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund and whether you anticipate uh, that some of those monies being awarded in that fund being done on an accelerated basis in federal legislation. I have to see what the final package comes out with, but uh, I do think that you'll see uh, um, we're in order to get the economy jump started and to do it has two components. But you get that you get all this out. I think we're going to try to push as many things forward on an accelerated basis as we can, from an economic standpoint, and then also recognizing that we don't know where the virus is going. We may need every bit we can get done every month that we get something extra done sooner means more people have access. Thank you. Great. Uh, I think we'll, we have time for one more question. Congressman, um, uh, one of the questions in our queue uh, is surrounding middle mile. Uh, just your thoughts on, you know, IOUs have been instrumental are starting to become more and more instrumental in, in some of these middle mile efforts. But um, some folks would like to hear your thoughts on you know, expanding that those efforts to the home as you see um, electric cooperatives in particular um, providing some uh, fiber solutions. Um, would would welcome your thoughts on, on that dynamic and if you see a, a path for some utilities moving forward in that space. Yeah, I mean every community is going to be different, and, and uh, some of the technology may not may not. Every community is going to be different. Some of it will work in areas, right. and some won't. So each each group will have to make that decision. But I do think there are opportunities there, in areas where, particularly when you're talking about uh, you know rural electric corporate uh, companies and cooperatives and so forth, where they've got the ability to build both the middle mile and uh, maybe provide the service. That's a decision they have to make. It's a little bit different, but they've already got a lot of the infrastructure built, and it, it is an area that I think that that each individual company should take a look at, and then they have to make a decision based on you know what's already in the community and how much uh, market, that, because they want to make sure that they can at least break even, um, how much market is there, but I, but the middle mile part is, is extremely important, and particularly if you already have an incumbent who just doesn't have the ability to build out, you know, five mile, miles down to Farmer Jones's place. But you can get them to within a half mile or a quarter mile, and uh, and then 
maybe in cooperation with, uh, if I, and I hope I'm answering the, the question that you asked, but I, I do see possibilities where if there is no incumbent or nobody who's willing to go that last quarter mile, then maybe the, the rural cooperatives can pick that up. But a lot of times they may want to work in a partnership with one of the local folks that's already got the infrastructure for programming and providing the service. They provide the middle mile and then and then the uh, incumbent provides that last quarter mile. I hope I got the right question out of that. Yeah, that, that was that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and Congressman, thank you again for your your time uh, being thank here you. today. We we sincerely appreciate it. I know you have a a very busy schedule, um, and uh, please let us know how we can ever be be helpful moving forward on on broadband issues and and other issues you are working on. Well, and and if any of the folks on the line you know have some great idea. Let our office know uh, because you know if it's something that's going to change uh, and make things better uh, throughout the country, but particularly in rural districts like mine, you know we don't know about it. We can't push it in Congress, and I'm more than happy to push any ideas that I think will help move the ball forward. Certainly, will do. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. You too. Well, thank you, Congressman Griffith, and thank you, Dave, for moderating that Q&A. And again, I want to ask folks, uh, we do have some questions that we couldn't get to, but we're going to move things to our panel just to be use the best use of our time. Um, we are here to talk, go into details now, and hear from rep representatives from Appalachian Power and Dominion Energy, along with their partners. So we're first going to turn things over to Brad Hall, the Vice President of External Affairs at Appalachian Power, and Michael Clemens, President of GigaBeam Network and talk about their partnership that they've done together. And then we're going to hear from Dominion Energy. And then at the end of all that, we'll take questions. So uh, Brad and Michael, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, folks. Good afternoon. Thanks for, for having us today. Really, uh, I'd like to thank Rob and, and the team there at the Utilities Technology Council for inviting us to be part of this, what we think is a very important panel. And, and by the attendance, uh, we think a lot of folks think it is as well. Uh, I hope you appreciate the, the picture that we've got up there. It, it's a beautiful picture of the Appalachian Mountains in Virginia. And I assure you, it's better for you to look at that than me and my quarantine hair and quarantine beard. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll give you that beautiful picture. But, but at the same time that these mountains are beautiful, they also create one of the most difficult challenges in solving the digital divide. Uh, the mountains that you see, uh, they they are a significant challenge for fixed wireless solutions and for hanging fiber. Uh, the beautiful trees that you see are, are, are a challenge when storms cause those trees to fall on those lines and we have to repair them. And, and then the narrow valleys and beautiful rural landscapes lack the dense population that really makes a project like this economically feasible. Uh, so as though this area is beautiful and we love being here and being a part of this area, um, this beauty creates challenges for us in solving the digital divide. If you would go to slide two. Thank you. Uh, so just real briefly, just wanna let you know who Appalachian Power Company is. Uh, we, we are uh, a power company. We're a subsidiary of American Electric Power. Uh, we provide power services in Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. We've got about a million customers and 3,000 employees, and you can see the map there of the states where we serve. Uh, those red boxes on the screen represent the various generation units across the territory, which total about 8,700 megawatts of power, including hydro, uh, natural gas, coal, and, and some solar. Uh, we have about $3 billion in annual revenues and a net income of $311 million. And as I said, we're a subsidiary of American Electric Power. Uh, we have seven operating companies across 11 states and, and assets in well over 30 states. And that's just a little bit about who we are. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Michael's going to introduce himself and a little bit about GigaBeam. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to talk about the company and our project. Uh, as you can see in this slide, a uh, little bit of uh, background on the company. Uh, I founded it in uh, 
1997 as an IT company. We mainly did uh, network support for local businesses, uh, you know, computer repair, those kind of things uh, initially. And soon, right after I founded it, I, I got into the to being an ISP uh, with dial-up, as I'm sure all of you can remember the wonderful days of uh, 56K internet access. <laughs> um, from there, we kind of uh, grew the company uh, as technology changed, uh, uh, adapting mainly into fixed wireless uh, to provide broadband to the area. Uh, starting in 2004, building our first tower. Um, at that point, we were doing one to three meg service, which was considered broadband at that time. Um, and it's expanded since then as technology has improved. Um, and, and here in the really the past couple of years with this project and a couple more, we've actually gotten into building hybrid networks. Um, in the area we're at, just like they were shown in the picture and how the congressman talked, uh, it's, it's very rural, very mountainous, uh, and very tough to, to deploy fiber uh, and really, you can't just come out on it economically. Um, so a hybrid approach really makes the most sense, um, and that's that's what we're focused on now is trying to deploy fiber and wireless uh, where we can. Uh, beyond that, we're looking to expand from the area that we cover now. You can see in the in the map there; those are the counties we currently have service in, with Grayson uh, being marked at the bottom. That's where this project will be. Uh, but we're looking to expand from that in the whole area, uh, in uh, mainly West Virginia and Virginia. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so, you know, I just wanted to give you this this picture here to, to really kind of show you the benefits of rural broadband. And that this a project like this has dual benefits. Um, but, you know, there's challenges. In 2019, the FCC reported that over 26% of American families in rural areas lack access to 25-3 speed. That's 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabits per second upload speeds. I think those of us that live in these rural areas may argue that that percentage is much higher. Uh, you, you heard the congressman mention that we're looking at new ways to, to evaluate these FCC maps, but we know that these FCC maps are quite inaccurate. Uh, they're based on census blocks, and if one person within a census block has 25-3 speed, then that census block is defined as served. Grayson County, Virginia is a great example of this reporting challenge. Uh, based on the FCC maps, Grayson County doesn't even qualify for the Rural Opportunities Development Funds. Uh, so I think that's a great example of the challenges that we have in these maps. Uh, so the approach that we have, we think, is going to be a unique approach that will be a catalyst to solving the digital divide. Uh, our approach has multiple benefits to the customers. In addition to the benefits of, of getting high-speed Internet, it also creates the benefits of a more smart grid, a smarter grid, that will positively affect customers' experience, reliability, and resiliency for our electricity customers. The blue columns on the left, highlight the benefits that customers get from the high-speed broadband internet. You already heard the congressman talk about a lot of those things. Uh, but making sure public safety uh, uh, areas are served, making sure that we have fiber infrastructure to economic development sites or industrial sites so that we can attract industry. And then, of course, telehealth. Um, on the right side, you see the green columns. Uh, that kind of highlights the benefits of a smarter grid. Uh, right now, if we're deploying smart meters or smart circuits, those are being communicated to through either RF, radio frequency, or through cell service. And, and those services are through a third party. And, of course, if you're in a very rural area, uh, we may not have the ability to even communicate with the device due to the rural nature of, of the, the challenges in communications. And that presents challenges in and of itself. If you're in a more populated area, uh, you may have traffic issues on those. And so by having this fiber backbone out there, we're able to communicate to these devices and then drastically improve reliability and resiliency for our customers. Uh, Mike, why don't you talk a little bit about um, some of the things that Grayson's going to see from, from that improvement that they're going to see in, in high-speed broadband access? Uh, sure. Uh, one thing that uh that Grayson did, they actually uh, performed a study and, and 
to find out exactly how unserved they were just because these maps were so wrong. And, and a big part of that was the citizen survey. Uh, they got a huge response from it. Uh, I think it was close to 900 and some odd responses, which was a good percentage of the county. Um, the interesting numbers come out of that is that, uh, well, when it comes to public safety facilities, like fire departments and, and fire stations, things like that, over 50% of the county uh, were unserved or have, ser have speeds under 10 megs, which is not good. Um, another stat that came from those surveys and the maps is that 54% uh, of the residents and 52% of businesses in Grayson have no broadband greater than 10 meg. So uh, obviously a very unconnected county that needs uh, needs help. Um, the other wonderful benefit of uh, having a fiber optic solution is it pretty much future proofs them. Uh, you know, this network that, that's being built will be utilized for decades, uh, all with minimum uh, or minimal uh, repair costs and things like that. So it's something that, that will be used, you know, kind of like the phone system was back in the early 1900s. Uh, it's going to carry on for, for years and years. And, and the other thing is when it comes to connecting to the Internet, all roads lead to fiber. Uh, no matter how you're connected, whether it be on a cell phone, fixed wireless, what have you, it eventually is going to get back to a fiber circuit. And having that fiber built closer to the customer in Grayson, even if they're not directly on that fiber but on, on the fixed wireless part of it, uh, they will see a, a better performing network and be able to get faster speeds and, and handle um, you know, more customers and things like that. All right, if you go to the next slide, the, uh, the image here on this slide uh, really illustrates why we believe that the, the project we're trying to do will, will allow us to build the middle mile faster and more economically um, or, or than other providers. And, and the reason is, if you look at that image, we're going to hang that fiber in the power supply space just below the neutral. And from a power company standpoint, we wouldn't allow any other third party that wasn't a certified contractor for us or one of our trained employees to hang in that space. The communications providers hang in the communication space. And so for this middle mile project, we're gonna hang that fiber in the power supply space. And what that does is it allows the communication, fiber, the, the communication company not to have to deal with the make ready process, which can be very slow, very cumbersome, and very expensive um, because if, uh, say, Gigabeam wanted to hang fiber, we may have to go out and move things in that space because there's not enough room in the communication space, so we'll have to wait on all those third parties to come in and move their their equipment so that, that Gigabeam could hang their fiber, and, and that really slows the pace down significantly. So by hanging it in the power supply space, we believe that we can speed this process up significantly. Uh, the design of the fiber network is being done in collaboration with our ISP, which is Gigabeam in this case, so that the network is located to mutually benefit both of us in the process. So it better serves our customers and theirs. Uh, we'll build a point of presence building uh, for the, the network aggregation, and Gigabeam will own their own electronics, and they'll be lighting their own fibers that they lease from us. Mike, you want to add a few things there? Uh, yes, that's pretty much exactly how it will work. Uh, you consider Appalachian Power basically to be like a middle mile fiber provider, um, giving us access to dark fiber that, that we like. Uh, we maintain all electronics, uh, support the customers, uh, provide the connectivity back to the internet through a data center, all those type things, uh, which is a, a good blend in the collaboration we're doing. It just, uh, uh, we both fit together really well. Exactly. Thanks, Mike. Uh, go to the next slide, if you would. On this slide, I just wanted to give our audience uh, kind of a background of how we got where we were. You heard a little bit of that from Congressman Griffith just a moment ago. Um, but leading up to 2018, uh, we had begun the idea of how could we as an investor-owned utility get involved in solving this digital divide. And, and we did that because if we can help our communities to grow, that of course allows us to grow. 
and a growing utility is important for all of the communities that we serve. And, and so we began talking to key stakeholders, including the governor, the governor's office, the tobacco, the tobacco commission, our local state and federal legislators like Congressman Griffith, talking about how we could play in that space to help solve this decades long challenge. So during the 2018 legislative session, the passage of Senate Bill 966, which is the Virginia Grid Transformation and Securities Act of 2018, allowed us to start on a path toward building the pilot project we're talking about today. The legislation contained a provision that required investor-owned utilities to perform a feasibility study to determine our company's ability to participate in the rural broadband solution. APCO conducted that study throughout 2018, and, and we submitted our final recommendations to the Virginia legislature in December of 2018. The study concluded that we were uniquely positioned to deploy middle mile fiber but we also made it very clear that we had no desire to be an internet service provider. And, and really the reason for that is, is it's not our core competency. That's not what we do. Uh, Mike, why don't you talk a little bit about what was going on as we were doing that feasibility study? Uh, yes. Uh, one of the first things that, that happened for us, and it's something I've been working on as a, for our company in the past several years, is creating partnerships with uh, localities in the region. Uh, mainly knowing that that this was a problem that needed to be solved, uh, you know, for for every county in in the area. Uh, so we've we've worked on that a lot with uh, Grayson. They actually sent out an RFP in 18, 2018, for a partner to uh, to work on solving uh, the broadband problem there. Um, we uh, applied to that RFP and and were awarded that in early 2019. Um, this was before any of this uh, had been decided and that uh, Appalachian Power decided to pick Grayson for this pilot. Um, so initially we were looking at uh, a full fixed wireless approach to uh, to solve their broadband problems, mainly because of, of funding. Um, it, it just, uh, it would take a massive amount of public funds to, to make a fiber network work in a rural area like this to, to for just the numbers to work out. Uh, so we were looking at a five-phase approach uh, to build fixed wireless in that county. It would take several years to complete uh, and get it all going. Um, in the middle of all that, uh, Appalachian decided to, to pick Grayson uh, for this pilot, which changed everything. And at that point, we uh, uh, started focus on redesigning based on uh, having this fiber backbone that covers uh, approximately 70% of the unserved uh, residents in the county, uh, with the other 30 uh, percent being on the hybrid of a fixed wireless network coming off with this fiber. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, so we didn't know that was going on at APCO, and, and we were pushing forward with the project, not realizing what Gigabeam was doing with Grayson County. And then during the 2019 legislative session, Delegate Israel O'Quinn, who lives in Washington County, sponsored a bill that allowed us to petition the Virginia State Corporation Commission for a broadband project, project like this. And, and so we developed a team at Appalachian Power uh, to develop this. We were looking at demographics, we were looking at topography, amount of unserved customers, and, and we looked for a region that had already begun to lay the groundwork on how they would solve this. And that's when we found what was going on with Grayson and Gigabeam, which just really married up with what we were looking for. And then in, in May of 2019, Governor Northam signed that bill into law, and we actually did it uh, right there in the courthouse in, in Grayson County. Uh, then in 2019, in July, we, we actually filed a petition with the SEC, and we had a hearing in January of 2020. And then on March 6th of this year, we actually received an order from the commission allowing us to build the Grayson County project. And, that may seem like a long time for some people, but to really go from not having the legal ability to do anything like this as an investor-owned utility to then getting a case submitted, having a hearing, and getting an order to move forward in that period of time, I think, is just really a testament to the teamwork that has occurred here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So between July of 2019 and March of 20. 
uh, you know, we, we had a lot of things go on. And I just want to point out that, that Mike and his team at Gigabeam has just gone above and beyond. Mike was a witness in our case with the SEC. He testified on behalf of the case. And so finding a partner like that is just key to the sex, the success of something like this. Uh, go to the next slide, if you would. Uh, so just quickly here, we'll go over just kind of an overview of what this project looks like. Uh, you saw a map there earlier that uh, Gigabeam showed us. But this map on the left here depicts Grayson County. And, and the blue lines that you see on the map represent the middle mile fiber that Appalachian Power is proposing to build in this project. Uh, Grayson County sits just on the northern border of North Carolina, several miles east of Interstate 77. And as the Congressman mentioned, the, the terrain in this county is very difficult. Our thought was that if we could build it here, we could build it anywhere. And it would be a great example uh, for how we, as this industry, could impact the digital divide. Uh, we're going to be building 200 miles of fiber at a cost of approximately $17 million. Uh, that cost, of course, would be recovered from our Virginia customers. But any and all leasing dollars that we get from leasing to Gigabeam or others that may need dark fiber, we would return all that revenue uh, back to the cost of the customer, offsetting that cost to the customer. Uh, the green shaded areas that you see there represent the areas of Grayson County. And, and that just represents those customers that have 10 megabits or less download speed. Now, what's interesting here is that the law in Virginia defines unserved as those that have 10, one or less speeds. And the FCC defines that as 25, three. So that gray area that you see only represents those customers that are 10, one or less. If we added 25, three or less, you, you would see that green shaded area grow quite a bit. So according to the FCC data, uh, you know, we, there's only about 3,700 meters or metered customers in Grayson County that are unserved. And that uh, we have 11,000 customers that we will go by with this fiber route. Um, so the work that Mike referred to there a moment ago that Grayson County did with their consultant to really go beyond the FCC data was very important for them to be able to get a hold of those state dollars for broadband. And still, even in the situation we are, Grayson County doesn't qualify for the Rural Opportunities Development uh, Funds for, for broadband. Um, so thanks to the work of the team and our friends in the legislature, this project is going to be bring gigabit service to these customers in Grayson County. Uh, Mike, anything you want to add to that? Uh, that's pretty much everything there. Like I said, uh, we've talked about some of the statistics earlier uh, in that green area. Uh, like I said, it's 54% of the residents and 52% of businesses uh, have 10 meg or less or no service. And a lot of that, if, if you've ever been to Grayson, uh, there's not even cell service. Uh, you know, it's, it's hit and miss depending on where you're at. Um, it's it's very rural and in uh, and, and dire need of, uh, of getting connected. Um, uh, Grayson is probably one of the least connected uh, counties in Southwest Virginia. Uh, you know, there's others that are, are as bad, but this one is, is, is one of the top ones. Um, and, and honestly, without the collaboration and partnerships we've created, this never would have happened. And, and, and it's just a game changer for that county. Thanks, Mike. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Uh, just want to very briefly show you that we, we are looking to do this in other areas of our territory. So this is a project that we are working on right now in West Virginia. Uh, this is a two county project for Logan Domingos counties, which is just north of the Kentucky border. And we would deploy 400 miles of fiber here and, and go by 34,000 meters with a significant portion of these customers unserved. Uh, but we do have favorable legislation that's going to allow us to do this. It goes into effect on June 1st. And we're going to be submitting a case to the West Virginia Public Service Commission in the fall. And we're looking for an RFP. We've got an RFP out there right now looking for our internet service partner for this project with the deadline to submit to that project is, is June 30. Let's let's go to the next slide. Finishing up here, 
I, I thought it was very important that we provide some lessons learned for our audience today about what we've seen and what we're learning in, in the, the multiple jurisdictions that we're working in to try to move this, this forward. First, I think it's very important that you have a well thought out business model. You gotta develop a strong team. You gotta be transparent with that team. And most of all, you've gotta be very persistent because you're gonna run into roadblocks. It's gonna be very difficult because like in Virginia, we, legally we couldn't even do that as a company until we got the law changed. So that's very important. Uh, secondly, each area is unique. So make sure you understand the area. You gotta review the FCC maps find a way to look beyond those maps. Are grant dollars available in that area is very important. Uh, will you have an ISP that's willing to work in the area? Uh, make sure you understand your demographics and the population densities, and then really understand the needs of the community. You know, do, do they have healthcare services? Is telemedicine important? Is there an industrial park that needs this service? You really need to understand those things. Um, third, I would say, you know, identify communities that are working to prepare themselves. Uh, you've heard Mike and I talk about that today, that Grayson was doing their homework. They were working to be ready for an opportunity. And we're, we've tried to work in some areas that have not done that legwork, and it's very difficult if they have not. So finding a community or a region or a county that's done that is very important. Mike, you want to talk about those two points and the business case point? Uh, yes, it, um, he basically hit the nail on the head there. It, uh, uh, having the locality prepared for this uh, is very important uh, just because of the speed and, and scale of deployment. Uh, uh, being able to have this project shovel ready in, in a year is an amazing feat, and it would never have happened without collaborating with Grayson County and all the planning they did beforehand. Um, with their consultants, uh, things we did for them, everything. Um, uh, the business case falls into all of this, it, really in, in, in rural areas in general. Um, the numbers have to work even in a partnership this way with public funding and everything else. It's so rural, um, you have to know who you're dealing with, how many customers there are, and, and to make it viable, make it a long-term solution for, for the county uh, for decades to come. Thanks, Mike. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and this, this will be our last slide. Uh, one last thing I wanted to point out on lessons learned, and, and we decided to call it the collaborative model. I mean, it is key. If you don't have the right partners at the table, this thing is done before it gets off the ground. Uh, you've got to design that, that middle mile with the last mile in mind. And if you don't have the right ISP, uh, you, you are in trouble because it, it's got to be about more than the money to the ISP. Uh, if it's just about the money, I, I don't think they're going to finish this because it's too hard. And I think Mike would share in that sentiment. Um, but without support from your local, state, and federal officials, the project is over before it begins. And I just want to leave you with this. What a team we have. We've got Giga Bean, who is ready and willing to do whatever it takes, testify whatever it took to get this project off the ground. Our county administrator there in Grayson, Bill Shepley, man with a heart of gold, willing to do whatever it takes to help his county in this regard. A consultant that went above and beyond to help the county. Congressman Griffith, you can't say enough about him, a champion for the cause, who has been with us from the beginning on this. Delegate Israel O'Quinn, who was willing to sponsor a very controversial piece of legislation to do what's right for the people of Southwest Virginia. And he stays connected with us constantly to make sure this project is moving forward. Uh, Governor Northam and his administration, a champion to find solutions for the digital divide. It's the Tobacco Commission focused on providing funds and creating solutions. And I can't say enough about my team at Appalachian Power who is tirelessly worked for almost two years to find a way to, to get something like this off the ground. And, and because of all of that work in the team, uh, we are now in the planning and engineering phase of this with that scheduled to be done and construction to start in December. And the good news there is, is that Mike and his team are gonna work in parallel with our team. And so it, it will be a 12 to 18 month construction. But as we complete sections, Mike is going to be doing the same thing with Gigabeam, 
And so customers will be able to come on board as we complete sections of the project. So can't say enough about what we've done here. Mike, any last comments? Uh, the, you covered it all very well there. Like I said, it's uh, we've planned this uh, to go fast. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, like I said, every partner in this has, has gone to bat and, and has just done a phenomenal job uh, to make this happen. And it it couldn't have happened without us all working together. Uh, that's, to me, the, the most important part of everything we've done. That's right, Mike. And that, I think that picture on the screen there shows it all. Uh, you, you know, you've got the governor, you've got the president of our company, Delado Quinn, Mike's smiling face there right behind the governor, and uh, just a great day that happened right there in Grayson County to sign that, that bill into law. So, um, Rob, that, that finishes up for us. Well, thank you, Brad, and thank you, Michael, for that tremendous presentation. The questions are pouring in. We'll get to them after we hear from our next set of panelists. But again, just want to remind folks to please use the chat function. We'll get to your questions. And uh, rounding up today's discussion, we have Lane Chambers from Prince George Electric Cooperative and Nathan Frost from D Dominion Energy, Virginia. They've taken a different route here. And um, please turn over to the, the floor to Nate and Lane. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you, everyone. Uh, Congressman Griffith, thank you for your opening remarks, as well as your continued support with this initiative. And thank you to the UTC team for facilitating this webinar. Um, getting started, uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I took the approach today. I really wanted to, to tell a story, um, learning from history. Um, I believe history is one of the most important learning tools one can utilize. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to cover the brief history of Prince George Electric Cooperative, the birth of Prince George Electric Cooperative Enterprises LLC, and the evolution of rural band. In the fall of 2016, we began deploying a fiber optic network with the intent, just like most, to gain downline communications on the electric grid at a more granular level. From this initiative came the concept of serving underserved rural homes as an ISP and the birth of a pilot project referred to as the West Quaker Road Pilot Project. At this time, a group of electrical engineers, a lineman and linemen, along with the vision of a bright young engineer coupled with a lot of support from our upper management team embarked on a mission of uncertainty. As the boots on the ground were beginning to endure through the fog of war, preparing for the first in-home hookup as an ISP, little did they, or should I say we know, the impact we would have on our slice of rural America. With every install of Wi-Fi, as our members would refer to it, uh, I began to witness firsthand the life-changing impact this service would or could have on all of rural America. Unbeknown to many, this was the beginning of a cooperative effort and partnerships were beginning to form. Next slide. A vital part of rural band success begins with this first partnership, one of a unique kind, as a partnership developed with Prince George County here in southeastern Virginia. This partnership led to the connection of over 500 rural homes, bringing those homes up to standard some of their neighbors less than a half of a mile away had enjoyed for many years. Rural Band has since this initial partnership joined hands with leaders at all levels, working together to ensure broadband equality throughout the surrounding communities. Fast forward through the ups and downs and you'll find us where we stand today, entering yet again into another, an additional partnership this specific partnership is with rural Surrey County, and it would be it would prove to be more difficult as the locality in which we were partnering with had very little broadband availability to the citizens and covered two electric utilities service territory. To this point, rural band had minimal deployment on facilities on other utilities infrastructure. This project had the potential to be the most difficult and challenging to date. As plans were being laid and work was starting on the Surrey County project, a call came in to rural band of quite an intriguing nature. Dominion Energy was inquiring about opportunities to partner with rural band 
aiding and serving those underserved in rural Surrey County. I have to admit, I found this to be potentially one of the most unique bonds that we could forge to date. Next slide, please. As conversations began between the two entities, it was clear that Dominion Energy intended to deploy a fiber optic network in which it would potentially have excess dark fibers available. It only took a couple conversations, though, sitting down with Dominion Energy's team to understand their idea of a partnership was much more than just leasing dark fiber capacity to serve their service territory. Dominion Energy was dedicated to this partnership and making this partnership one in which would flow very smoothly for the common goal of serving those who had been left behind for quite some time. Partnership has opened many doors uh, that would have been much harder to access had the two entities not shared a common goal. Uh, some of the benefits from that, this, this partnership has led to an open flow of communication uh, between Dominion Energy and Rural Band, the coordination of logistics, um, as far as the planning goes and building out, and also a direct channel to the various departments for both organizations. That, that open line of communication is, is tremendous to have. Uh, one of the challenges that Rural Band had seen in previous deployments was curbing the expectations of the citizens in the areas which it would serve. A project of this nature takes time, and today, more than ever, a timely deployment of a fiber optic network and these underserved areas is of the essence. Uh, we've seen in the past few weeks, working through the current pandemic, that, that life can change in a split second. Um, it, it, it truly can. Um, <clears throat> United, we have a very unique opportunity um, in working with Dominion Energy Next slide, please. Um, here you, you see Lighting Rural America, the slide up here, and, and this slide really hits home to me because I have been intricately involved in various aspects of the deployment of rural broadband to homes. And in closing my piece of this presentation, which I, I would really like to share that this effort in lighting rural America with broadband really shares a striking resemblance to me of the first lighting of rural America through the, the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. This is a time of need in which America came together through cooperative effort, effort through partnerships, working with legislators and innovative minds to provide the rural areas with a tool to broaden opportunity and equality. I see today as an opportunity to learn from these successes of this initiative back then and learn from history. We have today entered yet another crossroads and through partnerships formed and common goals shared, place ourselves in a fine position to yet again light rural America. Next. Thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Uh, again, this is uh, Nathan Frost with Dominion Energy Virginia. Um, give you a little bit of background about uh, who we are and kind of what our uh, rural broadband journey has been like. Uh, you'll hear a lot of the same themes um, that, you, that you heard from uh, Appalachian Power. Um, it, it's really a lot of those same fundamental pieces of legislation that uh, really created this opportunity. Uh, but for some context, um, Dominion Energy Virginia, we're based out of Richmond. Um, we serve about 2.6 million customers in Virginia and Northeast North Carolina. Um, we are a regulated integrated distribution transmission and generation company. Um, we have about, it's approximately 23 billion in rate base. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see a map of our distribution service territory. Um, the dark blue areas represent the areas we serve. Um, and you can see that it's, it's broad and diverse. We serve everything from the oceanfront in Virginia Beach, uh, to the Allegheny Mountains on the border of West Virginia. Um, we serve major metropolitan areas of, of Northern Virginia, which are really just the, the suburbs of DC, uh, Central Virginia, and then uh, down east, uh, the Tidewater area. Uh, but what you can see as you, as you look at the map is that we also serve a lot of rural, rural areas. Um, and a lot of those are adjacent to cooperative territories. 
Um, the area that we're talking about today is the one that's in that red circle. Um, that's Surrey County. It's hard to see, but there's really a, a, a river that kind of uh, runs north of Surrey County that separates uh, Surrey County from the Williamsburg area of Virginia. Um, next slide. Uh, and this is kind of an overview again of our, of like I said, our journey. It's it's really similar to what Appalachian Power walked you through. Um, the fundamental pieces of it really were the, the 2018 Grid Transformation Security Act. Um, again, that was an extremely comprehensive piece of legislation and really laid out the framework for modernizing the distribution grid for the IOUs in Virginia. Uh, and importantly, it was uh, it really gave us the, the framework we needed to, to build out our telecommunications infrastructure. Um, that broadband feasibility study was one that was, uh, it was really just an enactment clause in there um, that really required the IOUs to, to look at, can we serve and how do we serve uh, potentially as a middle mile provider in the state? Um, just like APCO, we filed in, in late 2018. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, there was uh, the 2019 legislation we call it HB 2691. That's the one that you heard about from Delegate Quinn. Um, and again, can't underscore just how foundational that is for this effort. Um, really, the um, the effort on behalf of our policymakers in Virginia are really the ones that deserve a lot of the credit here. They've they've kind of um, really opened a lot of doors that maybe we otherwise would not have even been aware of. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it's, it's that piece of pilot legislation that really uh, that makes all of this go. It's really the oxygen in this initiative. A little bit of a different approach that we took um, last year um, is that we issued a RFI in the summer last year. Um, we really wanted to just cast as wide a net as possible. Um, so as part of that IS RFI, we wanted to solicit interest um, from both localities and ISPs. We wanted to hear from any and all um, especially the localities, we wanted to hear, you know, what are your thoughts on on broadband that's being served in your communities? Have you done any uh, work to understand what that served, unserved population looks like? Uh, and then we wanted to hear from the ISPs about who would be our potential partners going forward. Um, so it was a really good opportunity for us to inform ourselves uh, about the just the broadband uh, networks within Virginia. Um, and, and from that, um, since last summer, we've been um, in doing a lot of diligence and, and working through a lot of the feedback that we had there, but developing uh, projects and partnerships, uh, like the one we're talking about today with Prince George uh, Electric Co-op and their um, subsidiary, subsidiary rural band. Um, we are uh, building towards a regulatory filing later this year. Um, so that's something that we're working on diligently right now. Um, as you heard from from Brad uh, at Avco and, and Gigabeam, you can you can tell it really takes a village, um, not just to put a project together, but also to to bring forward a regulatory filing um, for consideration by our commission. Um, so that's what, um, in addition to doing all the hard work of, of collaborating with Prince Prince George to understand where we're going, it's it's also about building towards um, building a, a really good case that we feel like. Uh, um, it can get approved by our commission. Next slide. Uh, and here's a brief overview of, of the area that we're talking about. Again, it's uh, still very much under development and we still need regulatory approval of this, but this is a look at what we envision right now. Um, the fiber deployment that we see as part of our middle mile solution is about 42 miles along our distribution lines. That's represented by the dark blue lines that you see kind of um, going uh, almost creates like a cross through the uh, through the county um, and that's kind of where we're focused right now is on on working through getting through the scoping and design and working diligently with lane steam to understand um, kind of what you know where do they need us how do they need us and making sure that you know what we're deploying here also serves very much a benefit for our operations and our customers um, so what you see developing here as you look at something like this on the map is um, we're meeting a lot of different needs, both from, from Wayne's perspective of being able to enable uh, broadband deployment, um, you know, for the citizens of Surrey County, uh, but also it's a win-win in that, you know, it can give us visibility, uh, better visibility into our operations within that area. Um, and, and just like you heard from, from the folks before, really when it comes down to, to rural broadband, it requires a ton of collaboration 
and commitment from all parties to, to really look for solutions. Um, that's at the local, state, federal level, um, both with cooperatives and electric IOUs. I mean, it's really all of the above. Um, and, and hats off again to my team. This is something that, you know, it's funny when you think back, uh, 2018 wasn't long ago. And when you think about how far we've come this quickly, it's, it's really, a, I think, a testament to the hard work from, from the folks in, uh, within Dominion and also with uh, Rural Band. Um, so I know we've got a ton of questions and, and obviously there's a lot of, uh, a lot of same sentiments between us and APCO, but again, just want to underscore the, uh, uh, the admiration that we have for Rural Band and, and helping us bring this forward. It's, it's been a great, great collaboration and partnership, and we're really looking forward to, to bringing it to fruition. So turn it over so, for, thank for questions. You both. Or, yes. Yep. yes, so I want to just thank all of our speakers for their time today, and um, we do have a number of questions, and to help us through that, I want to turn things over to UTC General Counsel and Vice President of Policy, Brett Kilborn. Brett. Thanks, Rob. And uh, first off, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, it was a really great presentation. Um, so some of the questions that I was able to read, Rob, I'll, I'll ask for your help as well in terms of fielding some of these questions that are coming in. Uh, I want to first raise the questions that were submitted by the attendees on the webinar today. So one of the questions that came in for folks at um, Appalachia Power was, are you connecting reclosers, cap banks, uh, and other utility apps for distributed automation? I'm sorry, you broke up. Are, are we connecting what? Uh, reclosers and um, cap banks for distributed automation. Yeah, we'll be putting what we plan to do is to put multiple uh, smart circuit devices reclosers on on the circuit uh, in time as we build out the project we would do that and then we would use the the middle mile network uh, to communicate with those devices great and then there was another question that uh, was asking about what was the name of the consulting firm that on the grayson project I believe it's Rural Broadband Solutions, and the owner is Sandy Terry. Okay. And then another question was, are you using, uh, are you providing dark or lit fiber? We are providing dark fiber, uh, so the internet service provider would be responsible for their own equipment and lighting of that fiber. Uh, we're also building a, a point of presence building that would allow for the aggregation of that that network. Great. And I think you mentioned that the bill was kept controversial. Um, if that was the case, how so? That's one of the questions. Well, uh, I, I don't know if we have our friends from the telecommunications industry on the phone, but but uh, some of those folks were, were not really happy or keen on us uh, building out a project like this. And uh, but, you know, we made it very clear to those folks that you know, we don't want to be a service provider. That's not our goal. And so we, we did have some negotiation that, that had to happen with those folks and other folks that didn't think that it made sense for an electric utility to get involved in this. But, but you know, the evidence is, is that we are already building these communication uh, uh, networks out there and allowing us to build this closer to the customer to get to our substations and to get to our smart circuit devices and our smart meters really emboldens the, the, the grid that we have and the dual purpose is getting this much needed high speed internet service out there to the customer. Great. And there were a couple of questions from an engineering standpoint. Uh, one was why just the middle mile? I assume that's mainly because the legislation only allowed for that. But the second one was um, why did you choose not to go with the low loop fiber design? Uh, our, our design is looped. Okay. <laughs> there you go. And it, it, I don't think it represents I itself well on the map I show I showed, but but it is it is a fiber loop. Okay, great. Uh, and then 
I guess general question for all the panelists, especially on the utility side. Um, can you talk a little bit about the specific benefits to the utility that went along with deploying these fiber networks? So the benefits that I talked about early on, to make sure I understand the question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the benefits, it's, you know, the utility apps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from the utility perspective, uh, I, I mean, one is, you know, all of our utilities, uh, anybody on the phone, including Dominion, we have a very diverse uh, economic development program. And, and as we all know, high-speed internet service is key to attracting industry. So uh, one benefit is being able to get these fiber networks out to uh, potential businesses, commercial and industrial customers that, that need this service to grow, which allows our network to grow and our, our company to grow and provide more service. Uh, other benefits, uh, if we go back to that chart, um, I think it's on our slide nine, is really allowing us to get those smart meters better connected, which gives a better um, a better position from a cybersecurity standpoint because we have more control as a utility on the communication between those smart meters and the smart circuits. Uh, we can control that network where now we're very dependent on third parties and though it's still secure, it's very secure, you obviously can be more secure if we as a company are in control of that network. And then uh, when you go into a territory like Grayson, um, you know, much of Grayson County doesn't have LTE cellular service and so we don't really have the cell service in many of the nooks and crannies of the county to be able to communicate with these devices so we're having to build RF mesh networks that will communicate back to a point to get cell service to be able to communicate with those devices and so that's a huge benefit and then just from the general customer standpoint is if we have those smart circuits out there and with our smart meters, we can more quickly respond to service outages. We can more quickly know where those outages are and isolate so that if we've got a thousand customers on a circuit, instead of those thousand customers staying out of power for a period of time, it will isolate down to the, say, 50 customers where the, the damage is, and then we go pair that and get everyone back on. Uh, it's going to improve their reliability from that standpoint, meaning they stay in power uh, more, you know, longer because being in the mountains of Appalachia, uh, reliability can be difficult on some of these circuits that are, you know, traversing the very beautiful and difficult mountains that we live in. And that all equals a better customer experience. I hope I answered that question a little long. <laughs> that was good. Hey, hey this I guess, is Nate. Uh, good. I was just going to say that that was a great, great answer uh, by Brad. One of the other things I think it'll do is obviously as we think about what the modernized grid looks like and and obviously I, I think in addition to the Grid Transformation and Security Act, which had a lot of, um, it basically directs a lot of investment in renewables. Uh, and then as you see over the next few years, we're going to be, uh, you know, not just Dominion, but more broadly um, required to to meet RPS standards and things like that. Integration of renewable energy is going to be critical for us. Um, so having a robust telecommunications network that gives us better visibility into our system will become critical because as we start to integrate these these more intermittent resources, um, you know, it's going to become extremely important for us to have uh, better visibility and control uh, once we start to really bring in significant amounts of renewable energy. Great. So Rob, I'm sensitive to the time we've got here. I want to make sure that we're, we're staying on schedule here. So we've got a lot of questions, and I want to make sure that we're not uh, running over. Are we okay as far as that goes? Uh, we we I think we're about 15 minutes. I actually do have a I have a question real quick. I wanted to ask um, Good. Nathan and Nathan and Lane regarding the ideas of an industrial utility and a cooperative working together on these issues. Is, is there a, I mean, it may sound easy to say there's a synergy there, but I'm just kind of curious what that relationship was like to, to build that out and to come together between different utilities to 
helping solve this this problem. Yeah, this is uh, this is Lane. I'll touch on that. And and to be honest, um, it it was very easy. Uh, you know, we really haven't had any roadblocks or anything like that. The line of communication has been open. Um, I truly feel that Dominion Energy is is just as committed as we are to make this a very very viable project. And it's all about serving. You know, it, it's it's about doing something for the community. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have seen uh, a lot of change in the areas that we are serving. Uh, these folks for so long in these rural areas have, have not had the ability to, you know, have some of the benefits that just neighbors a mile or two down the road had. And, you know, Dominion's commitment along with ours with this, it, it, it hasn't been any issue, what's issue whatsoever. I agree, Lane. Um, I mean, yeah, honestly, it's been a breath of fresh air. We've worked really, really well together. Um, a lot of mutual respect. Um, absolutely open lines of uh, communication. Uh, and like you said, uh, just a real commitment to that community. I mean, at the end of the day, we both want to see, you know, those communities thrive and succeed. Um, it, it benefits us, and, and there's a whole host of reasons um, that that everybody's touched on today. Um, but for us, it's you know, honestly, it's been it's been great. It's been, um, yeah, I've just really enjoyed working with them. So. Picking up on the community aspect of this, I was curious, Nathan, when you pulled out your RFI, what was the response like? Did you get a lot of overwhelming response from communities that were looking to get access? Uh, we did. Um, and as you can imagine, um, some communities were farther along than others. Um, so it really helped us kind of uh, focus on um, and maybe think about different phasing of different projects to focus on those that might have been most mature early on. Um, and, and then think about how can we um, maybe nurture some of those other communities that that might need um, a little more time to put together their plans. Um, so for us, it, it really uh, it was really beneficial from that perspective. Uh, we did have a lot of response. And then also importantly, the, the ISPs, um, you, you know, getting their feedback about about their perspective because it's going to require a partnership everywhere we go we're the middle mile provider the law i mean literally the, the pilot legislation requires us to to partner with somebody um and, and we're not experts in that field we've never done this before so we really needed that that feedback um to kind of help just help us do our job better um so it was it was very beneficial um and I, it's funny we still find ourselves going back to it sometimes um just because there, there was such a a wealth of good and useful information out of it. And this is Brad, I'll just echo, you know, we didn't do an RFP for the project, but but as soon as the, the legislation was, was signed, I mean, we had communities coming out of the woodwork, contacting our community affairs folks about their interest to be involved, and, and that allowed us to collect data on what was going on out there. And, and we went and interviewed, uh, interviews probably a bad word, but we met with, all the internet service providers throughout the region to get feedback from them and what was important to them and it was just a great experience to see how well this was received because the need is so great super that's great feedback and that's really consistent with what UTC has been witnessing across the country when utilities have decided to um, go into broadband. Um, they it's not only been in the areas that the utilities have served, but they're also finding that these surrounding communities are crying out as well. And so, in a lot of cases, cooperatives, especially electric cooperatives, have been going out and providing service into those nearby communities as well. So that's you know one of the aspects of this that I think is is really important to emphasize is, you know, how much, you know, these communities need us and how much we can be able to provide connectivity into those areas, whether it's directly through utility or in partnership with an ISP. 
so yeah i mean it's it's been great to hear you know how well these partnerships are working out um i guess one of the questions i have there is you know there were been some discussions here about how you're planning to expand services can you talk a little bit about where you see this going in terms of the next step you know just everybody that's a question for everybody yeah this is uh lane and i'll touch on that um you know i've actually put a lot of thought into that question myself and you know it it's really hard to tell because this is so new um it's an evolving process it, it's really hard to to put an answer on that um we're committed to go to where the need is the areas in which we serve uh we have a substantial amount of citizens in these areas that do not have the availability to this service and and as a cooperative and our subsidiary rural band we're committed to making this work for our community um it, we have seen since the beginning of the project uh, in in the process of being an isp that we have to be able to adapt and improvise to make these things work for so long these rural areas haven't had this opportunity because it was difficult um we still know that there are challenges ahead of us but you know with these partnerships it's only making us stronger and gives us the opportunity to move forward and expand in the future this is brad at appalachian power uh, you know we we very much are interested in continuing to expand on these projects uh, as you saw in my presentation we're already working on a two county project in in west virginia uh, we already have a team uh, put together to start looking at a potential second pilot in Virginia and even thinking ahead to a second project in West Virginia. And then from a corporate standpoint all across American Electric Power, uh, the different operating companies we have in the 11 states we serve are looking at what is the potential to do some of this in the other rural parts of our service territory. So, uh, we're very interested in, in bringing a solution to the digital divide, and, and we're working hard to figure that out. Great. Yeah. Hey, this is Nate. I was just going to say, yeah, we've, you know, obviously we've got a lot of uh, work still to do um, with our uh, partnership with uh, Rural Band. I mean, we still need to kind of shepherd that through the regulatory process and, and execution phase. Um, we are having uh, discussions, and we have many other projects under development. Um, we, you know, just like AEP, we're we're looking to continue to try to serve those communities um, that that need some amount of broadband. Um, so, just from our perspective, this we, we see this hopefully being one of many that we get the opportunity and pleasure to do. Okay. So, Brad, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, why don't you see if there's one that's, that we can ask that's been submitted because right now I'm having a hard time seeing them. Sure thing. Uh, we did get a question from an attendee. not quite sure if they're writing from a utility perspective, but they're being asked by their marketing group to consider providing lit services as middle miles. So what, is the, what are the panelists' thoughts on that? What services? I did. I was. It wasn't clear to me when you. you uh, lit services there. as middle mile. Oh. They're considering. Why they're being asked to consider providing lit. You know, what this, this this group is being asked to consider providing lit services as middle mile. What do folks think about that? Is that a way to go? So I can tell you from Appalachian Power's perspective that we we don't have a desire to do that. Um, because when you get into that situation, we would now own the equipment, have to manage, monitor, maintain maintenance of that equipment provider. And, and that's, I mean, again, it's just not a core competency for us to do that. And then, of course, where we're hanging the fiber in the uh, power supply space, you know, we're going to provide access uh, down into the comm space so, so that uh, they can manage that their own equipment in that way. Just from our perspective, we don't see it being an efficient and effective way 
to do this, uh, it's better for that provider to provide their own so they can control that part in their service for their customers. Yep, well said. You covered it, covered it very well, Brad. Great. All right, uh, I think that'll wrap it up. Um, I want to thank our panelists again. I thought this was really great. And I also want to thank all of our attendees for jumping on this webinar. Um, you may have seen in the last slide that we do have uh, another couple of webinars coming up. Um, there's one on May 28th uh, that's exclusively for utilities uh, from the FCC talking about the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, and that one is free to UTC members. So really encouraging uh, utilities to avail themselves of that opportunity to get their questions about the RDOF answered. Um, and then we've also got a June 3rd FCC Form 601 Licensing Summary webinar and also a June 9 broadband deployment case study webinar. And there's also much more that you can learn about if you go to utc.org uh, under news and events. And then also I just want to make sure that uh, folks that are on the call are aware that we have a utilities broadband committee within UTC. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis and that is another way that utilities can network with each other and learn about the latest um, developments. And one of the things that we're uh, developing right now is a um, broadband workshop. We've been holding these for the last couple of years around the country. And our next one coming up is going to be uh, in August. Um, so you'll be able to find more information about that if you go to the UTC website. So with that, uh, I guess we can go ahead and adjourn uh, if there are no further comments. And thank you again for participating. Yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, I've been getting questions about slides, so we will make them available. Please email me. You can see my email address right. Let me change the slide here. And uh, if you have questions that we didn't get to, or we did get to, I believe I got to all of them. But if some questions come to you after the fact, please feel free to write to us, and we'll get them out to the panelists. So again, thank you to everybody. Thanks to our panelists. This has been a fantastic discussion. And we look forward to hearing from all of you all soon. Thank you.